Um, hello, everyone. I would like to welcome you to this evening's talk for the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. Um, I can tell you a little bit that I know about the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute. It operates both uh, in New York and in Abu Dhabi. And the way that it actually was established was to be sort of the um, forerunner of NYU in Abu Dhabi. So it started doing public programming in Abu Dhabi even before the university was built. Um, I'm going to let you sit down. So uh, tonight, um, I, we're going to talk with Vikram Devesha, and uh, I am Deborah Levine. I am an assistant professor of theater at NYU Abu Dhabi. I have a PhD in performance studies. I want to shout out my dissertation advisor is in the house. So <laughs> um, I, I kind of feel like I'm back home. But uh, I've been teaching in Abu Dhabi now for five years. And for the last, when did I meet you, 2016? For the last? Yeah, uh, so for the last couple of years, I have actually been engaged in discussion with Vikram Devesha. And uh, as part of our mission at Abu Dhabi, we are really charged with trying to meet people who are doing work in the creative environment um, in the UAE. And my colleague, Maya Allison, who runs the art gallery at NYUAD, uh, called me up and she said, would you be interested in being a mentor to an artist, to a quote unquote emerging artist? And it turns out that Vikram isn't so emerging that he had a real <laughs> body of work. But um, it, it was through an organization called Tashkil. And Tashkil is a, an arts organization um, and it's situated in Dubai and I knew nothing about it beforehand, but I said, yes, I'd be interested. And Vikram actually, had a choice of people that he could work with. And you know, we've talked about this before. I still am not 100% sure why he chose me. Uh, but, but it's been a really fruitful conversation. And literally, for the first year after we had a formal relationship through the critical practice program at Tashkil, we talked every single week, probably for two, two and a half hours, Friday mornings. Um, and we Skyped because I was in New York for part of the time too. So, and, and we read theory together. We talked about Vikram's work together. We, he took me around to places in Abu Dhabi and Dubai that I had never been to before. I met more warehouse managers than I've ever met before um, because it's a part of his practice. And so it's been a really wonderful time for me to actually learn about the UAE through Vikram's eyes um, and, and to engage with someone who really has both an established art practice and an amazing curiosity both about the place that we were in and now Vikram is actually doing an MFA in, is it sculpture? New genres. Uh, new genres? New genres. New genres at Columbia oh, no. University. Um, so he's here in, uh, in the place that I call home to, and for the first time, you know, I'm not lost, and he got lost coming here today. <laughs> so um, before, I, I'm going to introduce Vikram. I'm just going to read a quick blurb about him. Uh, he was born in Beirut. Uh, he grew up in Mumbai, and he, for the last 10 years, was based in longer? 12 years. 12 years, was based in Dubai. And Vikram's work addresses labor, time, and value. His practice has been developed about around what he calls found processes, the forces at work within state, social, economic, and industrial spheres. Intervening directly on these processes, Devesha introduces glitches, or realigns a system, generating an altered, amplified outcome. Constantly negotiating for existing material, space, and labor, he navigates communities in deepening dialogues with potential participants. And by aligning himself to the system, Devesha adapts his strategies as the project evolves. Recontextualizing the ebb and flow of goods through a warehouse, we worked on that one a little bit together. Reframing agency among municipal gardeners, and superintending the regeneration of context as uprooted bricks from a bus stop or relaid elsewhere. 
Such are the situations created across a practice invested in the social dynamics of an actual urban space. His engagements translate into public art, sculptural installations, videos, and drawings. Um, uh, the, the thing that strikes me about Vikram's work before we get into it is that no matter what, uh, the work, no matter where there seems to be abstractions in the work, the work always casts an eye on the lived experience of life in the UAE, and he engages with how those experiences are lived. Um, and I'm going to do something before we get into the talk, which is my colleague Maya Allison at the NYUAD Art Gallery actually traced sort of the beginning. There's this story that she wrote um, about the uh, new culture of radical, formal, and conceptual experimentation in art and writing in the UAE. And she, she relates it to this um, house in the Satwa neighborhood of Dubai, where artists, writers, and intellectuals took refuge in one another's company. And she said the artist who lived there made art from the refuse of daily life around him, and this was Hassan Sharif. Most of the visitors were his art students, Mohammed Kazam, the poet Adele Kozam, his brother Hussein, also an artist, and the artists and writers um, who also came from the Emirate of Sharjah. And uh, in this house, is, uh, is where all of these artists started to put together an art practice, looking at nature and environmental installations, um, and looking at also the refuge of the new, uh, the new city that was being built in Dubai. Um, and, and this was from nine, around 1988, and it was a group of artists that everybody looked toward, uh, new generations of artists looked towards as initiating a contemporary art practice in the UAE. Um, Vikram comes after this group of artists, and there are a number of them, like Mohammed Kazam, that uh, he has, who have curated his work, that they have been in conversation with. But there's this moment where um, Vikram, as an artist who is not an Emirati artist, comes to the UAE, and you actually came to the UAE uh, as, a, as a graphic designer, yes? As a, as a copywriter. As a copywriter. Um, and so I'm going to actually ask you to just sort of tell your story of coming to the UAE, and, and the way that he talks about uh, his art practice is looking at the UAE as a place of import and export, I sometimes feel like, as a person who came to the UAE because NYU um, basically exported their brand and, uh, and landed on an island, Sadiat Island, in Abu Dhabi, there is a way in which we all feel like uh, we're all different kinds of migrants in the UAE. And, and his work really engages with that in a way that this sort of narrative of um, the first group of Emirati artists and, and the contemporary art scene had a kind of mythology to it. And what I really like about Vikram's work is that in some ways it, dis it, it both continues and disrupts that narrative. It's, it's less mythological rather than it's um, really dealing with the lived experience of what it's like for all of us, uh, as we are temporary people in the UAE. Great. Um, so I think we'll start from this slide. But Great. You've gone, you've gone uh, a little bit further behind. Um, so I actually came to Dubai in 2005. I just floated in at that point. Um, yeah, like I just came following someone, essentially. That's, and I didn't expect to hang around over there for so long. Um, and it's interesting that you speak about like that phase, because after a few years, you know, um, I realized that, hey, like, you know, I'm in a relationship. Like, often we get involved in relationships, but we, we, it takes a while before we even acknowledge that. And in that sense, I think after, I think after five, six years, I just realized, hey, like, I'm, like, you know, in a, in a full-time relationship with this city. Because at that point, like, I always considered, you know, I'm going to hang around in Dubai for a few years, make some money, and maybe actually kind of go to film school. I actually wanted to write s scripts at that point. I didn't know that. So, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and, and somewhere along, like, 
but, but I always had an interest in the visual arts. Uh, but Dubai at that point was a, a very, and still today, is a very specific situation where, where I think I could sense there was a turning point in, in how uh, there was a, a potential for artists to sort of, you know, operate out there. Like, I would say literally functionally operate out there. And I think that that's where I started making my investments in. So, uh, and at that point, actually, I never knew a lot about, like, Hassan Sharif's work. Like, I had... You know, at that point, I was really, I wasn't so engaged with the art world. Literally, I kind of didn't know anyone within that circuit. Like, I would often go to galleries and all by myself, but I wasn't invested in that scene. And, uh, and so maybe I can, I can jump to this, this slide, which is going to give yeah, you... Uh, the one thing that I just wanted to say, too, is that uh, in the MOU AD Art Gallery exhibit, uh, which was called But We Cannot See Them, there part of the narrative was that there actually weren't support organizations for these artists when they started thinking about how to make contemporary work in the UAE. Um, by that time, there were some organizations that were actually supporting the work of Emirati artists and trying to actually think about what is contemporary Emirati art and Emirati culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, Martha says here, Campus Art Dubai started in 2008? No, earlier? 2011. 2011. Yeah. But, but there's what, what happened is that there started to be an ecology of um, support systems for artists to be able to start to figure out together, um, and people pretty much knew each other, how to make art. But mm -hmm. Vikram actually not being an Emirati artist who was not connected in those networks at mm -hmm. first. That's interesting you spoke about this idea of export and import. Right. And, and coming back to that, uh, I think what, hap was, what was happening until that point was that, that the UAE was a node for export and import, but actually it was a node for importing things. You know, we had uh, a local art scene of galleries, and often the work would come in over there. You know, and, and, and that became like a platform for exhibiting artists from the region. Um, but on the other hand, there wasn't much that was, you know, emerging from the UAE. Um, and so coming back to some, someone like me out there, like someone like, like me realize that, hey, this is a very specific situation. Like what's come together in the UAE isn't happening anywhere else. And how can all of this be translated into creating, you know, uh, material, cult cultural material, which if not exported from there, at least it's produced over there. It's not kind of you know, brought in over there. So I think that's a very specific dynamic about how you think about UAE, because it's historically been a node where things came in, sat down, and moved out. And for me, if I think about this as a metaphor, like someone like, there's a whole bunch of artists over here, Gada's over here, there are different artists uh, you know, in different schools and different programs over here, who have sort of turned around that situation for themselves and are taking things outside now. So I feel that's, that's, and I think that that came through like, you know, an invest, investment from the artists over there. You know, how else do we, so how else do we engage with the UAE is an important question. And, and that sort of was never, and I think that was happening. You know, if you go back to even like Hassan Sharif's work and, and that body of work, like they were engaging with, with that site in a very specific way within, uh, I would say, a smaller circle. And that engagement, was, was translating into like a body of work which has now come to light. Right, but the narrative, like the sort of uber narrative of the UAE that I, I had gotten before I, went, before I went to NYU Abu Dhabi is that like all of the culture was being imported there, right? So that the major institutions like NYU AD, the Louvre, the Guggenheim, mm -hmm. all of these things were coming in and that there really wasn't this um, sort of fomenting an emerging culture for local artists who were actually looking and making, looking at and making contemporary work, right? And, and that, like, how do you see that, even though there are these networks mm -hmm. that are actually supporting it, is this question of how you entered it, too. Like, how did you enter the system and start to figure it out? So I'll say that there are two kind of layers to it, or two sides for me. One is that, so there were platforms like Campus Art Dubai, which came around. So when you think about the Art Dubai Art Fair, which happens in March, for these five or six days, everybody comes down to Dubai and then disperse, you know. But now, now that thing is expanded, right? Like you have like, you know, the Campus Art Dubai program, which is an informal art school, where you have visiting 
you know, curators, writers, thinkers who come in and engage with that community. And then uh, the Campus Art Dubai, uh, I mean, I, I won't get into it, but it's an informal kind of uh, weekly or like sort of a gathering of writers and thinkers and artists. They themselves have taken on uh, that, that, that situation and expanded it. And, so, and there are a lot of different nodes that are operating in a similar way. Right. Which are being like Tashkil and the Critical yeah. Practice Program where we met too, mm -hmm. right? So there are actually these um, organizations that aren't as uh, sort of spectacular as the major either art fairs mm -hmm. or institutions that are being built in the UAE, mm -hmm. but, but are actually supporting God is here too. So supporting artists mm -hmm. who are really thinking about contemporary practice. And, and, and I feel like that's, that's an interesting uh, place to be in because UAE is not so formalized. Like everything is not consolidated. There are, it, it is still like in many, many spaces where you would expect uh, it operates as an informal economy. I think that's where I step in. That's where I, I sort of saw potential of how can I engage, how can I have an artistic practice out there? Like, I, A, I couldn't afford a studio. Like, I wanted to make large scale work, but you know, I, I cannot have a studio out there. I still had to work to kind of pay my bills out there. And, and so I started stepping out into the city. Now, I, I wanted to kind of find new ways of engaging with that, with that place. And uh, I started visiting, you know, construction sites. I started visiting um, the owners of, say, a construction factory. Uh, because initially, I was interested in making sculpture using concrete and cement and, and the materials which I literally kind of saw around uh, in the UAE. And also, I Because felt, that was the moment of the, yeah. the like, a huge construction explosion yeah. there. Yep. Yeah. Like, I'm at least seen six years of Dubai being developed, so, like, I couldn't kind of, you know, take that out of me. And, uh, and also, like, initially, I, from, I think at the beginning, I was, you know, ambitious in making works which were large scale. And I feel like that, that ambition also, in some way, was, you know, mirroring how Dubai wants to behave. You know, like, they want to do kind of things big and grand. And it's got the space for it. It's got, like, the material for it. it it's got all these, you know, possibilities which somehow like maybe must have you know infected me to kind of make such kind of work. So early on like I went and I, I, I met like a, a factory owner and told him I want to make these large pieces of road sculptures and of course I can't make them in my apartment. So he gave me, uh, he gave me a seven month uh, period of you know a large space in his factory. Uh, I would say almost like 50 meters in length by, by two meters wide like that's a really large volume of space. And I was experimenting with to trying to make like this work from tarmac and you know, concrete and cement. And I, and I made a body of work at that point. But I think what, what was more important was that at that point I realized that uh, the material out here is not like what I'm making, but the material is, is a situation that's possible. The material is, is the, the faculties which are available to engage with. So when I walked out of that place, what I realized was that and what maybe he didn't realize, the factory owners were that this is the first, this is the person who gave me my first residency. You know, it was a residency in, in, in an industrial site in a, in, a, in, a, in a free zone somewhere in Jabal Ali, which is, you know, yeah, like. They don't know, no one Yeah, knows. yeah, somewhere <laughs> in Dubai, like you have this massive warehouse, warehouses out there. And, and I think that sort of potential is what, but the thing was, you know, it wasn't an official thing. Like, can I work out there, can I not work out there? Some of these sort of spaces is, is where I sort of want to kind of, you know, step my, put myself into and see what can come out of that. So I want to frame something too, because mm. usually um, I think that when we think about the UAE, we think that it's a much more controlled environment uh, and more stratified. And the thing that I learned when we started talking is that there are, when, when you talk about these free zones, you're actually thinking about um, sort of these these ways in which you can negotiate space, uh, people's time, um, their goodwill, and people will just give it, mm -hmm. which, which was a little shocking to me. Like, I didn't understand that at all about the UAE, but it was something that you understood too because of the way that um, migration happens, migration and labor happens in the UAE too. Some of it was the way in which you negotiated like in Mumbai as well, but the UAE had much more opportunity there. That's something I found out over there, like, you know, 
and I, I think I quickly sort of realized that this is what I can only work with. Um, I, I think the other part I must also kind of admit is because I can speak uh, Hindi, I can, you know, speak with a community, but then I can speak English, so I can speak with another community. Um, and I, allow to, I, can, I can mobilize myself through these environments, through these social situations. Um, and on the other hand, I was just surprised about how, like I walked into kind of warehouses, I walked into factories, and people are, are willing to have you know, an aesthetic discussion. Like they're open to kind of that dialogue. Um, and I feel like that's, like when you turn around someone's office or site into that sort of space for something to sort of emerge, I think that's kind of what shifts still, you know, uh, my possibility of like, you know, making that warehouse or that factory site, you know, um, a studio for myself. So we should actually look a little bit slides, through yeah. some of the work so that people understand a little bit more what you're talking about when you talk about going to warehouses or working with gardeners or just going into any kind of business and mm -hmm explaining the aesthetics of your project and assuming that they're going to actually want to participate in mm -hmm. Yeah? Um, so yeah, I mean, what we have over here is Urban Epidermis. That's the first project uh, I spoke about. I think the right corner on the bottom, you see like the space that I got where to make these um, road surfaces. Um, so essentially these are like large uh, pieces, I think almost 100 kilos each, say the height is around 1.2 meters by 2.5 meters. And what's interesting is that I first went to a road construction factory and they sent me the labs and taught me how to make a road. You know? And then literally kind of that lab became like a place where they said you can break down these materials, you can do this X, Y, Z. And then the other person gave me the space to work out there. And that's where how the work emerged. And, and it was just happening in all these spaces. Uh, I didn't even have an exhibition at that point. I was just making this work. And then somewhere there's a place called Traffic run by Rami Farooq. He's, he saw the work and he says, let's kind of, you know, let's get this up. So that's the first project I did. But then I think this is where I learned all of my lessons. And I, I think maybe this is where, sure. where I think that I started working with this idea of found processes. So essentially like this image, the large image is, is an aerial image of an installation, um, which is composed of uh, pavement bricks. And these bricks were uprooted from a public bus stand. And at the bus stand, uh, the bricks were in parallel yellow lines. Um, and then they were brought over to this exhibition site uh, where I hired a mason to, to install them. But he installed them within a time constraint that I gave him. And that time constraint uh, distorted the patterns uh, in the installation. So you gave him the agency to actually make the patterns? So actually, I didn't give him the agency. So I think that there's a backstory to this. It's essentially like I often see this in like Dubai streets where the, 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 the patterns on like these no parking signs are, are distorted. The bricks are arranged in a very bad way. And what happens is that when people repair roads, they'll remove the bricks. And when they put them back, they have to put the bricks back in a very short time. Uh, because A, the thoroughfare has to be returned, and B, the, the contractor can only afford so much time to arrange the bricks to kind of make it a profitable business. So I actually sat down with the contractor and we calculated how much time would he give his mason for one square meter. Um, and I took that, that number, that limitation, and on the other hand, I went to the municipality in Dubai and I almost spent two months trying to kind of find the right person who maintains the, the roads in Dubai. And he uprooted these bricks from me from a public site and he gave them to me. And then I took these bricks to this exhibition site and then I hired a mason and I made him work under a time constraint which he normally would face in his uh, regular uh, day job. So in your bio you talked about time and labor, right? Yeah. So the mason's labor, mm -hmm. first of all, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the kinds of uh, salaries and payment that that workers, we're, we're talking about um, the workers and labor salaries in Abu Dhabi and Dubai, right, mm -hmm. in the UAE. So did you, how did you think about that kind of uh, value and scale, uh, salary scale? So uh, I, that's something that we're all aware about, you know, at least like while in UAE, that uh, there's, the, the disparity is, is sort of something you, uh, you know, you, you face 
you, you kind of grapple with. It is there. It's quite exposed in your face in the UAE. Um, and uh, for me, I was already kind of engaging with, uh, with, with labor on a certain scale to make my work, you know, in some of my initial projects. And that's a question that I still continue about how can, how is like, you know, how is their investment in my work giving them also a stake within the situation? Um, on the other hand, in this case, for me, like that situation, which, which is decided by, you know, the social, social agreements or the economic uh, uh, um, agreements of the city has become the material for the work. Um. I'm going to go back to that because mm -hmm. you had a, there was a, <coughs> in Art in America, there was a critique a little bit of that written. Mm -hmm. They said, here, I'm just going to read it to mm -hmm. you. It said, yet there's a danger of treating workers as the city's overseers do, as raw material to be ferried about and used before being discarded. Power differentials are inescapable in Devesh's practice, and his work's always, uh, his work always risks instrumentalizing his collaborators. Even more questionable in his deep, and they call you deep, politicized engagement with labor. Mm -hmm. There is no call to improve manifestly the unjust structural conditions. Um, so I, I'd love you to respond a little bit to this question uh, where they called your work and the engagement with the labor depoliticized. So, so I feel that there's one layer about like fabrication and art production. Um, and that, that the word of fabrication really interests me. It's, it's like there's a lot of production that goes into making of an artwork, and that layer mostly kind of is left behind when an object is presented. Um, I am quite comfortable in sort of entering that situation and making that, those layers apparent in my work, um, which I feel is where like, you know, there is sort of uh, a certain transparency in like how I, I sort of engage in the making of the work. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I'm entering a situation to improvise it or improve it, or sorry, in, to improve it or alter it. You know, I, I work within my own sort of limitations of what, what capacities I have of like operating in the UAE. Uh, and within those margins, how can I engage, you know, with a certain community? is where I sit at. But I cannot, you know, it's not a social practice which is trying to alter a situation uh, that drastically as it is. But I feel there is some kind of discomfort in then when you, how do you confront this work? How do you, how do you kind of deal with it? Um, this work is the work that then got uh, dismantled and then brought to the Venice Biennale mm -hmm. recently too. So I want to come back to that. But with that question, could you move to maybe shaping resistance, yeah. and we can talk about that. So, from from where you were working with labor to with the masons under time and value constraints, then you actually started to work um, more collaboratively with a group of gardeners, mm -hmm. right, to make this piece, and then you actually called it shaping resistance. <laughs> Which, uh, the, the thing I don't know, <coughs> I'm sorry, I've been looking up. Um, there's, you know, there's really, quote unquote, no public space the way that we know it in the UAE. There's a lot of spaces that, uh, all these spaces are governed by institutions and by the state. Um, and they're not, they're certainly not places for, quote unquote, free speech. So, uh, the, the interesting thing about this for me is that it was a collaborative project with a group of gardeners mm -hmm. um, who worked for the municipality, mm -hmm. and you contracted with them. And then, but then there was a, there is some autonomy in the relationship, and you have a continuing relationship mm -hmm. with them too. So it's being configured a little bit differently, and differently than most art practices happen in the UAE as well. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so this work actually was curated about by, by, for a show from Murtaza that he invited me to kind of make some work in a public space. Uh, this is a garden uh, called Al Majaz Park uh, in Sharjah. Uh, it's a public park. And, uh, and so what I, my proposal was that I want to work with the gardeners who maintain the park um, and 
and do a drawing workshop with them, engage with them, and then come up with, and they would come up with some patterns, some designs, and they would uh, implement those hedge designs in the parks. So initially, this, this, these hedges were just box-shaped hedges, and I worked with five gardeners, and uh, each one came up with the design. And now, this is almost like a permanent artwork, where I, and after like, this work was done, I negotiated with the, with the municipality to kind of make it a permanent work, so it's just constantly maintained and it stays in shape. Um, so this is when I started working with them, and and initially when I stepped into the situation, like they couldn't figure out like you know who is this guy? Like is he is he a landscape designer? Is he an engineer? Is he a contractor? And it's taken it took me a while to establish that you know that I'm an artist, um, and I'm interested in different voices through through the opportunities that I get to to make work. And this relationship has continued like post this, so, uh, where, where I feel like as I went along, um, I think things started altering for me, like situations started changing for me as an artist out there, but I was getting more opportunities. And, and I, it was a very kind of clear question of this complicated commerce that was happening between like the notion of ethics, between like ethics and value, because in a sense, my career was you know, emerging out of these sort of, you know, uh, uh, gestures that I was making. And, and what was interesting was that uh, my dialogue with, with, with my, my exchange with the gardeners became, revolved around like the ideas I was trying to pursue. Like they sort of got a, gradually kind of, we all got a, they got a gist of what, you know, I'm invested in. And they found a space, a space, Within this, you know, in, within this engagement, to sort of, you know, express themselves in whatever smaller way or big way as possible. So this, from this relationship, a, a new project emerged. But can can I so, just slow down a little bit? Mm -hmm. Which is that, uh, like, they were making topiary designs, mm -hmm. but you were not telling them what kind of design to make at all. So, mm -hmm. so that they, these were actually gardeners who were in the municipality and taught to do, taught to keep the, um, the hedges a certain way, yeah? Yeah, it was a box-shaped hedge. Yeah. It was a 100-meter box-shaped hedge. There's so much of that in the UAE, too. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it's ubiquitous. But, um, but how was it that they understood that they had, that you wanted them to start to design it themselves, that they had some agency in the relationship, and uh, how, did, how did that negotiation happen? So uh, initially, like it took me a while. Uh, it took all of us a while to kind of get permissions from from uh, the Sharjah municipality, which is called Shuruk, one of the divisions. Um, and then I, I spent almost three months uh, doing these drawing workshops in the morning. So I would land up over there, um, and we would just just chat, try to draw, try to think about things. Um, and I think that's that was an important phase because. <coughs> It sort of, eventually even they kind of came on board to say like, this is what we can potentially do. How can we kind of shape these things? Um, and I was giving them prompts about like, let's think about like, you know, aesthetics. Uh, I was thinking about patterns essentially to kind of deploy on these, on these, on these hedges. And so we all started looking at like, you know, uh, patterns that, that they carried with them. Like if there was some embroidery, like, you know, on the collar of their shirts, or like you have like the mojri, which is like a specific footwear, footwear which is like you know embroidered, um, and then they would kind of you know show me photographs of like you know a pillow which they carried with them, which kind of had some some sort of design on them, or or even like you know a box of sweets or things like that. So uh, there was a certain sort of investigation which happened from there, and and I think that that's when we started even kind of exchanging images uh, or showing photographs to each other, and I think slowly that emerged into kind of WhatsApp exchanges. Um, where they would sort of, you know, um, some of the gardeners would, would just, uh, Fridays when they have a lot of free time, and so they would sort of look around for those things. And, and for me, that was actually the interesting part about like how they were then thinking about, you know, what can happen on, 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 this, um, on this site. And I would say there's also a certain kind of, like within this three months, I think a few of them also kind of, realized, so there's a very interesting story which happened over here, which I must tell you. 
is that eventually like, there was this 100 meter hedge, hedge and I had to kind of divide it in five parts. So what I said was, okay, fine, like this is, uh, you know, this is hedge number one, and this goes to Anwar, uh, because your name starts with A, and then B, C, D, uh, and such. And by that point, like, you know, like we would walk around and saying like, oh, this is what I want to do, this is what I want. There was some sense of claiming and, and kind of, um, What's the right word? Like when you territorial kind territorial, of yeah. very ever so slightly because eventually they know that this, this space doesn't belong to them and they're working out there. And then they said like why should like the hedge uh, why should like the hedge be kind of assigned as per the in English alphabetical order? Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm like so guys like so how do we work this out? And I can and I speak Hindi so like you know there's a lot of kind of exchanges a lot of humor in there. And they said uh, yes say nee, this is not working out. Um, Let's do a lottery system. So we all put like chits and, and like, you know, and who, whose ever name came first, he, he got the first one, second one. So that's when they agreed with that system as against like, you know, the English alphabetical system deciding who gets the first, second, or third place. I, but I feel like there's a, what your work brings up for me is that uh, there's, it's, I start to be able to see that there is a lot of play in um, in the culture in the UAE too, mm -hmm. and there's there's also you know there's the sort of um, Uber system of governance right by the state which we mm -hmm. can think about and look at the law, but then there are the there's almost I, I keep thinking of them as um, trans localities uh, like tiny little localities that are always negotiations in in terms of governance mm -hmm. in terms of how uh, you know, actually, like, um, sort of cultural knowledge can can actually be, it, it isn't by force, right? It's mm -hmm. actually by cultural knowledge or, like, a way in which things can be negotiated differently. And I keep seeing that happening in your mm -hmm. work, too. Because it's, you also give it that time to develop. Like, it's, you do a lot of work and you do yeah. it fast, but but you also go for the long durée. Well, I, I think, I, I, actually, I've, I think with this project, I kind of stopped, uh, the idea of like delivery. So I think that that comes even from a background in like working in media where there's like, you know, this urge to deliver. Whereas actually like, at the opening of the show, there was nothing on the hedges. Like we actually didn't have anything to exhibit and people actually went there because there was a map <laughs> and, and uh, they just had started. And then this project actually went on for at least uh, six, seven months after which like it actually took form. And what's interesting was at that point, like this was in 2015, I had to come over here for a couple of weeks, and uh, basically, like the gardeners called me up over here and said, like they want to wipe out the hedges, they want to kind of cut it down now, for whatever reasons. And not the gardeners wanted to cut no, it down. No, no, the, the municipality. The municipality, or well, there was somebody new who came into like that part. I forget the exact details. And somehow, like we actually went back and and convinced and the us hold on to this. At that point, like I said, don't cut it down because I need to photograph them, <laughs> you know? And so that was a good enough reason to sort of, you know, uh, keep it at bay. But then I went back to them and I said, guys, let's just kind of keep this work because, you know, it's something that, uh, so the Shabir, one of the, one of the gardeners, he actually kind of has taken this image and, and he has framed it and is sitting in his village in Pakistan because his family knows about you know, he, he says for me there's a certain kind of, uh, he, for him it's kind of not about even the design, but it's about the engagement, the time we spend together. Like he says there was a certain thing in that, where it sits. And on the other hand, I would say like, there's a certain kind of, you know, diplomacy I like to kind of put into place with these institutions to say, like, we, we should keep this going, you know, and, and somehow in a very sort of informal way, this is actually a permanent work now. But, but that's sort of what you tap into in a lot of your work, right? Which is that there's always a tension between the sort of um, formal rules and mm -hmm. then the informal ways in which something consolidates and just becomes a part of the landscape. Um, well, I mean, yeah, I'm yeah, thinking yeah. about beach, I'm th but we can go to that too, okay. where you're actually uh, having people bring in unregistered mm -hmm. seeds and planting it mm -hmm. uh, in a rotary, in a yeah. traffic rotary. But, but just to come back to that, like, yeah. so as of now, there isn't like, you know, a public art department in the municipality. 
So, so that's why like, they, they don't know exactly how to negotiate with this guy. Because when I, often like artists would kind of go to the institution and the institution people would go and figure it out. Whereas I actually kind of go even to the municipality office and they can't exactly place who is this guy. You know? But I think that the problem is that they, there will be like a public art department in the municipality, which will happen with, with as things are changing out there. Uh, I feel like this area of, of improvisation and play will, right. will, will go. And that, that's something that I really kind of, uh, and that's why I want to kind of operate in a more invisible way. Like this work is sitting out there um, and it's not kind of, it's not even labeled anymore. Like there's nothing to kind of, you know, mark it. Uh, and I prefer it like sitting out but there. But the gardeners are still taking care of it. Yeah. Which is amazing. I mean. And some of the gardeners have moved out of that place. Some have kind of changed jobs and all. So I don't know even, I don't even know who's maintaining it right now, you know, <laughs> because they have different shifts now. They keep sort of, you know, changing things. But somehow, yeah, it's sort of, it's become, so I'm more interested in, in kind of work, like my work somehow getting um, ingrained in the everyday operations, you know, commercial operations. And I'm more interested in like it sitting out there as again sitting, you know, outside of it. Well then, <coughs> that's sort of a good introduction to the warehouse project, I think, um, if, oh, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, which is something that, you were starting to work on and we talked a lot about when mm -hmm. we first met. Mm -hmm. um, if you can just tell a little bit about the work and and I'll just, this work was done at Tashkia, um, at Al Sarkal Avenue. Mm -hmm. And Al Sarkal Avenue is actually privately owned, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to talk, do you, you want to talk a little bit about the history of that space? Yeah, so, so Al Sarkal Avenue is in an industrial neighborhood in Dubai called Al Cruz. It's full of warehouses out there. And Al Sarkal uh, owns a whole bunch of warehouses, part of which have slowly been uh, taken over by art galleries and cultural institutions. And this is very organic, it was a very organic movement started by the galleries and those creative bodies who were operating out there. They didn't want to kind of work in the towers and all. But slowly this place took on momentum. I think 2007 was when the first person moved in, the first time moved in. And also Carl saw a potential in this. And in 2016, they had another plot just next to it, and they built these <coughs> fancy new warehouses. And that's a, it was a very dedicated cultural district. And so you have like, you know, you have galleries like, uh, like Cousteau, uh, Leila Heller. Uh, you have the Third Line Gallery, which is one of the most important, you know, um, Dubai-based gallery were moved in over here. You have uh, you have the John Paul Najjar Foundation, which has a massive collection of important uh, American art, um, and all of these uh, uh, institutions and important cultural bodies were emerging in these spaces. Alongside, they had this public they had this program where uh, actually Mary Allen, uh, who's over here, myself, uh, and a few local artists were said were given a free hand to kind of do what you want to do with that place. And I was in conversation with the curator Tyrone. And so I was given a massive warehouse, a brand new warehouse, 3,300 odd square feet. In short, what I did was I basically went and bartered this space with a trading company in the neighborhood. So I was interested in Dubai being this uh, import and re-export hub. So every year, millions of goods come in from India, China, Malaysia, into <coughs> Dubai, and then they're re-exported into the region. So you have the Middle East, Levant, and beyond. And almost 80% of the goods are re-exported. And I somehow was exposed to this process, and I was really fascinated about how like, these objects are like in transit. They come, they sit down you know, for a few days, for a few months, and then move out. So what I did was I went to this trading company. I mean, I spent almost six months you know, trying to orchestrate this. And I said, OK, listen, guys. I know you guys are, they had like at least six to seven warehouses in the neighborhood, but they have a mass, they had a massive volume of goods coming in from China and they would hire or they would rent more warehouses to store that. So I said, you don't rent any new warehouses. I'm going to give this space to you guys for free for four months. And in exchange, uh, you allow me to exhibit your goods as art. So literally like I, and I can get a lot more details about it because they couldn't accept the fact that this guy is giving a space to them. So I had to have this corporate meeting between Al Sarkal's, you know, corporate team and myself and, and the trading company. 
And, and what happened was for four months there was this performance of capital where goods came in, goods went out. Uh, and you can think about it in different ways. For me, this was a conflation of art and commerce and capital. It's also a sculptural project where you, know, you have these goods coming up and going down and almost like it's not the artist who's sculpting or shaping them, but the market's demand and supply which shaping them. Um, and also like it just got back the space to what it was. A lot of people just walk by this thing thinking that this is another warehouse in Al Sarkar. Well, the, the interesting moment for me was that uh, uh, Al Sarkar is it, the uh, Abdelman Al Sarkar is the owner who is a very wealthy entrepreneur who made his money through these warehouses, right? And, and various other uh, various other right. There's a lot of there's a lot of um, car tires, like, right? Car tires. Yeah. Also, oh, I didn't know that. Um, but but also when you live in Abu Dhabi, there's also a huge warehouse district too, and and these warehouse districts uh, became sort of the it as Vikram said became uh, the alternate art scene, and it was this sort of almost seamless to me merger of art and commerce, mm -hmm. and like once a month you go to Alstrakal Avenue for. Uh, for the evening, all the galleries are open. You look at new work. There's, um, you know, there's drinks. There's uh, people are. There's music. There's performance. It it feels like a very vibrant scene, mm -hmm. right? And and then what Vikram did uh, in this custom warehouse that had never been a warehouse is turn it into a place of commerce again. But but then out of all of the places there. It was a place where the workers who worked um, in the, like, around the art gallery district mm -hmm. came and hung out. Yeah, yeah. Um, unlike the other spaces that we, like the, the sort of expats who were in the art world would go to in the mm -hmm. evening, like the Karachai yeah. would, guy would come in or people would come in and use the bathroom there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it became weirdly like um, sort of a, more like life in Dubai in this, mm -hmm. and, and it sort of turned everything upside down for it too. But it, it became this kind of great space that seemed like it was more of an open space where all of the stress, social stratification in Dubai kind of collapsed a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, and that was what was really interesting for me when, when that happened. Yeah, like, so just to give you a, a bit of a description, like the, the entrance space, Maybe it was something like this this room. And I kept that space empty for two reasons. One is because we had like uh, the warehouse project talks out yeah, there. But I invited a lot of people to kind of give, uh, to kind of speak. But also, uh, that space was kept open so trucks can come in and go out. I think a little narrower than this space. But what's interesting is that for me, that space became like this courtyard, like a traditional Arabic majlis in that sense, where you know there were all these different encounters happening. So, so I remember like when we first put the work work up, it actually rained that day and, and there's a there's a there's a person who sells steel in the neighborhood on a cycle and he came and he just took shelter up there. But then what was interesting was that a few days later when once the exhibition was up, and I think I was super excited about my work at that point. Like, you know, it was like all this there were goods worth close to a million dirhams that went through this warehouse. And I was like super You charged. have to tell them what kind. And so it's, these are all toys from China. Like they imported mm -hmm. all these toys from China. They were all boxes. So you had like, you know, Hello Kitty pink medium, or you had a Lalo Kitty super silly doll, or you had a big box of Buzz Lightyear which fell down for some reason. <laughs> so, you know, so there was all this kind of uh, drivel that, you know, that is kind of manufactured that kind of went through this place. And people try to buy them from you too. They were, yeah, and people also wanted free samples. Like they, I, <laughs> I'm like, but, no guys, like this is a, But know. it was, it, because it was just in boxes, uh, it was this like crazy space of desire too, because like all of a sudden, you really wanted that Hello Kitty more than anything, yeah. and yet it was impossible to access, right? Yeah. It was like in bulk, and it was going to be moved to another space, and yeah, yeah, you really, yeah. But I think what, what was interesting about like, what sort of pressures were being, you know, uh, generated while this was being, you know, being brought together. So when I, so there was a big MOU agreement, which I cannot make public, between also Carl and the trading company and myself, which basically was just a four month project. So even like the wall text that I wrote was then altered by their lawyers to kind of almost make it like a clause and arrangement and agreement. It was almost an agreement that was also kind of made public. Well, I think that Ulster Call at first didn't understand 
and were a little worried about what you wanted to do. I mean, they had to insure this, like, uh, and sort of a, a huge amount of goods, well, right? I would, say, I would say they actually kind of, in that sense, understood a lot more than me because they have a background of being uh, a warehouse, uh, no, being real estate folks. Uh, they're landlords, so they do understand like the the implications of what can happen. You know, if the tenant, uh, the tenant rights have to be because it's only four months. It's not a one year thing, you know. And so those things have to be controlled. But what's interesting, when the opening happened, the owner actually printed his own poster uh, and, and he sent it to all his uh, partners in the UAE and he invited them for the opening. And I was like, you know, I was like, is this his opening or is this my opening? <laughs> you know, but I think for me, that's the point where you know, that space you know, opened up right. for, for multiple it things. Regenerative. I, in, and at that point, we were just reading the commodity fetish together over and over. So it was like a Barbara Browning moment where it like that kind of um, desire, it just, it, it like felt super generative and, and proliferating all over. And, and some of the pressure that, that, you know, that money generates. So like at the opening, the owner came down and he saw that there were other empty warehouses. So he told the curator that, hey guys, like, you know, if you want, we can take those over. <laughs> and Tyrone was a curator he didn't know whether he was joking or not, you know, because it could actually happen. And for me, that's like the point where, like, I'm interested in work with sort of, you know, create situations and, and sort of a, a, a slight rupture within the operations of commerce. So I, I really want my practice, if it's successful, I feel like it has to be within everyday operations. And so then another day I was just kind of waiting out there uh, to meet a curator to pitch my next idea, and like she was super late. She was late by an hour, but I, like, I would wait for her. So, so this guy walks in, and he says, are you Vikram? And like there was a board outside, and he says, is this your warehouse? And I was like, super charged at that point. Yeah, this is my warehouse. Like, you know, like, this is my warehouse. And then he says, like, you know, this is like, Mar this is, like March, and, uh, and towards end of May and June is when like, super summer comes in. Like it just kind of burns everything. He says, like, you have no ACs. You know, and, and all your goods are gonna get, you're gonna kind of, kind of, you know, bring down all your goods. So he spent half an hour trying to sell me air conditioning systems and how he would duck the warehouse. He's got a massive background in, in air conditioning warehouses. He understands the temperature and the weather out here. And for me, that was, I think he, that was the best visit I had in the warehouse. Like I literally kind of, somehow he was so convincing. Like I actually kind of, wish I had the money to buy that because he really kind of, I was open to kind of getting sold anything and he was going to sell it, give me a pitch and I love that part, I wish I had recorded that somewhere and for me that was the part when the warehouse just became, it, it was becoming, you know, just not an art space but he said it, it became open to different businesses. Yeah, I feel like there's the work that you do gets the really potential of it gets realized when all of these things start to become really blurred <coughs> and I'm surprised that you said that it was your warehouse, but you must have been really excited. Yeah, I was super Because you usually, you're like, no, 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 it's, it's this or it's that. Like, in some ways, you kind of disappear from the work. Mm -hmm. But, um, but I'm, I had never heard you tell that story before. Um, so the, the warehouse project, uh, and, then, and then they, you had to move all the goods out, and it was gone. It became so, so there was an agreement that like uh, post the exhibition date, they, they still had a month. Uh, so they actually got a month before and a month after. So there was a leeway space. Um, and, and so they also kind of were selling goods. So uh, they had designed in such a way that they sort of had to kind of pull back things. Yeah. But can we go to the next thing? Because then we go back to this question of time and value. Can we skip through that? Oh, oh sorry, can we go to go portrait back. sessions yeah. maybe? So this is the piece that through the critical practice program you made for Tashkil. Mm -hmm. And Tashkil is a different kind of institution. Um, it has, it's an incubator space for people to work in who are doing like design-based businesses. And they also do this critical practice program for, uh, for emerging artists who are looking to do a fine arts practice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's also a community space, yeah? Mm -hmm. um, it, was and also, it was also like an art school earlier. It's a beautiful space. And uh, they have a lot of facilities, like from painting, printing, screen printing, uh, black uh, photography, right. they have a dark room. So they have all the supply, they have all the facilities 
It's almost like an art school which what turns it into like an art institution where people can come and make things. So I'm going to tell the story that uh, I'm going to say it on camera, but uh, when you were figuring out what to do with that, you wanted to engage with Tashkil, and the first thing he came to me was like, there's two guards who are at a guard booth, and I am completely fascinated with them, and like, there's nothing really that needs to be guarded about Tashkil, and these guys sit here all the time, and I want to do something with them. And, uh, and then you asked permission to do that, mm -hmm. and they said no. No, yeah. And then I actually wrote an essay about saying that this was the genesis of this project, and they didn't like that either because uh, they didn't want it public that mm -hmm. they didn't want you to actually engage with this sort of like weird quasi-authority mm -hmm. outside of the institution. So, but from that, mm -hmm. you started thinking about, again, time and value in relationship to labor. Yeah. Um, and do you want to talk yeah, about this piece? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So actually, Tashkil is uh, situated within uh, a neighborhood where I, where I think a lot of, uh, I think the royal family doesn't live out there. So there is, that's why there's like a lot of uh, police uh, and, and guard posts over there. Um, but but what, what happened during this residency, it wasn't residency, it's more like um, I had kind of, I had, I had a kind of a, a, an exhibition coming up over there. And I was given this space to work with, and I was really interested in a all of these facilities that they have. Um, but I can't kind of exactly pinpoint where, but I was interested in the spectrum of people that I've come to know through my my art practice. So at one level, I was engaging with with you know with gardeners, uh, with laborers, and and I sort of in some some scope I was privy to like you know. What, what they did, how much they made. I still had a, had a grasp of like how, how they got along in the city. And then on the other hand, there's other spectrum of people that I was working with, like, you know, somebody from uh, a big, you know, factory, uh, factory owner was supporting me also kind of to make work as an artist. So to, to kind of make it short, what I did was I did this project called Portrait Sessions, where I invited people to paint my pro portrait on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, every person who came in to paint my portrait was given a fee of 150 dirhams. Which is around $35? $30? Hmm? $30. And essentially what he or she would need to do is that they need to kind of calculate how much uh, time they can give me for $30 compared to how much money they make a month. So if you make X dollars a month and you work for 200 hours, uh, if I give you $30, how much time would you give me? It was a very basic formula, and that's kind of all kept private. And then you would give me, say, I can, paint, I can give you, like, say, half an hour. Now, depending upon your salary, you, your, you would give me a different length of time. And that became the time constraint for your painting. So some paintings were finished in, you know, literally like within, like, minutes or whatever, and some paintings took, like, a, a lot many hours. Now here's the thing that this sum of one fifty dollars, of one fifty dirhams, uh, basically is, in my experience, of working with with uh, or engaging with laborers in the UAE, I would often pay them one fifty dirhams to work for me for up to nine hours, and that's like that's not a standard daily wage out there. You know, it could vary, it could be lesser or more, but that's from my experience. So I took that basic value as as a unit. Um, through which I would calculate how much time a person would give me. Um, and the deal is that uh, I do not make the figure public, you know, how long you painted. I don't give your name out if you have painted my portrait. And uh, the entire thing is shown as, this is one body of work, and if it sells, uh, then we also have another agreement where I will share 50% of my profits with the artists. But then the artists are paid by the hour. So, if you give me half an hour, then you just get paid for half an hour. But if you give me 10 hours, you get paid for 10 hours. So there's sort of a reversal happening out there. So the, a couple things, which is uh, all of these are painted by quote unquote non-painters, non, non yeah. right? So when you think that you can figure out who only had 10 minutes and who had nine hours, the thing about them being non-painters is that undermines that a little bit too, right? You can't actually pinpoint like who might have only d had 
a short period of time and who had a longer period of time. You can because, all. well, because someone just could be a really lousy artist, right? Mm -hmm. Not that I would know anyone, but mm -hmm. uh, so, so there's a way in which you think that you know which ones took more time and which took less time, but there's sort of a destabilization of that as well happening in the, in the proposition, yeah? To an extent. But I think that if you could, I would say people- Oh, you were also telling people, you were trying to give them pointers on how to paint. Um, so I think all the people kind of who, who, who came into paint, I've known them in some capacity of my, at that time, 11 years of being in the UAE, and all of them are non-painters. They don't associate themselves as painters. Otherwise, I think the object, all, the painting only takes value if they are painters. Um, but I also sort of was open to, sh you know, sharing my skills of, you know, how would you approach, you know, uh, making a portrait. Uh, this made it more engaging. So some would say yes, that you know, if you want to kind of, I would tell them how you measure the face or how to use colors, gradation, and all. Um, but some of them would accept that. Some of them would just do their own thing. This, can you talk a little bit about the experience of doing this project? Because this is a, it looks different than a lot of your other work in some ways. So, I would say in a sense like, I've been thinking about like, how can I work with a site where, you know, I work with what's available, like the material, the space. And in a sense, Tashkil provided all these things. Tashkil had, it, it was a facility to kind of make art as against, you know, the construction factory was a space to make, you know, a piece of road. So in that sense, I feel like it does, you know, like the garden is a site for maintenance. So I wouldn't say like it actually differentiates in that sense. Um, and initially, in fact, I actually, want, I, one thing I wanted to do was kind of go back and doing drawing and painting. Initially, actually, I wanted to paint, but then, uh, I, I mean, like, I won't give you that, but we kind of dropped that idea. So I would say that, that part, it's not, I wouldn't say it's different in that sense. And in fact, I, I think that, again, like time, time and value are clearly illustrated out here, you know, but abstracted through like this, uh, this presentation format. Um, but I don't see it, you know, I don't see it like as a different, uh, there's a different material, literally, but I don't see it uh, working with another, in another way. Can we go to maybe a couple of questions? Did I answer your question? Um, yeah. It, I'm not, I'm not convinced. No, no, no. The, I, I'm not convinced either for a so minute. Let's go, let's go back to that. Okay, fine. Um, which is that I, I guess it's, for me, this one sort of begs the question more than anything of uh, where the artwork actually lies, whether it's within the process and these engagements that you had. Because I know that like, you give someone an envelope with uh, 150 dirhams in mm -hmm. it, it's a contract, mm -hmm. there's that relationship. Mm -hmm. For me, when we were talking about this a lot, I, you know, my investment is always in performance and it felt like in these processes that's where the artwork lay. Mm -hmm. But then we went to the opening and everybody, like this was a super fun one, everybody really just sort of liked it and like the amateurism of it too. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question really is, where do you actually see the, like, where is the artwork in this piece? So it's all in the transactions, as I said. Like, I felt, felt like each portrait session was, uh, was a clear situation of, of me hiring someone to make a work. And then also, it's like a, a scheme where you invest if you come in, you sort of by participating, you invest in that project where hopefully you, you, there's also a sense where like, so there's a contract that I've made which is between myself and the artist who's a painter. And that contract stipulates the agreements within this and I sort of break it down for them. Um, and, and, and so I think that that's where the work sits because uh, that's, that each session was was like however long or short it lasted, was where there was, you know, a clear sort of, it, there was a certain humor in that, but some weirdness in that, that you know, like I'm sitting out there breaking my back, and here's someone who basically, uh, some of them actually literally kind of started laughing at the end of making that portrait. 
you know, there was a certain kind of, they also kind of realized, okay, there is, there is this, uh, everybody realized that, you know, like, you know, here I'm trying to kind of work with maybe, I'm trying to kind of think about disparity as the materiality of, of the, the work, and I think that's just very, but then also he or she is participating in this situation. And on the other hand, he or she also knows me. It's not that I'm working with strangers. Uh, I think that's, and then, then there was also like this time investment from their side to, you know, I, I urge them, can you make the best, like this, this is in the contract, they will try to make the best possible portrait of mine as they can, you know? So there is a certain commitment I expect from them. You know, the, the fact that when I pay them the 150 dirhams, like I give it to them in cash in an envelope, um, you know, I'm expecting something back. And sort of, that goes back, so that goes back also into the fact that I only involve people who basically are earning money in the UAE. So the way I see it is in the UAE is a place where you work. You, you are, you know, you generate something. Unless you're like a dependent visa. Everybody out there is working and someone like me, if, if I'm gonna be work, at some point, you know, you leave the country as an expat because uh, you reach a certain age of retirement and you cannot retire out and you go back to your country. So there's always a pressure to be generative, to produce something. And I feel like that somehow also in some way echoes in my practice. And I'm always trying to, you know, produce material out there. And in a sense, I feel like I've become my own employee of my own practice. And so does it really kind of, can you really consider that as an artistic practice? You know, to kind of constantly be producing. Um, and then, and then I drag in people to also produce with me. But, but I think for me, this also collapses that question, that stratification of, um, you know, the, the different classes mm -hmm. of people that are really deemed by the state who can come in to work in the UAE and, and, the, way that, um, and the way that they're treated, right? And in some ways, you've tried to flatten that out so that it, it's always very spectacular to see um, the guest workers, as they call them, right, filing in at five o'clock in the morning to work on a building, or like it's almost a spectacle of that, and people are uniformed. Uh, and here, you've kind of obliterated and flattened all of that to to call attention to that kind of stratification too. That that there's there's actually more exchange that hap that mm -hmm. happens. Mm -hmm. And there's stratification too. Like it seems like there's a tension between those two. Because, because I mean, and the work already depends upon, you know, uh, the agreements he or she has already made with his or her employer. That's right. So I feel like they all, I mean, they already are participating in a stratified situation. Right. And and so this sort of almost, uh, I don't know, if it flattens it out, but like it could only kind of briefly get flattened out, you know. I think it's, it's right, and then maybe, it has to actually yeah. reestablish maybe, maybe it abstracts it for a brief moment, but I won't say it can flatten it out. But, but for me, too, it's, uh, this work constantly talks about this very particular way that labor is organized within the UAE, mm -hmm. um, and, and how maybe it's like there is more play in it, as you say, and especially you've been, you're like the prime example of how to be able to circulate among different kinds of communities mm -hmm. or different economic systems, but it but it then sort of it consolidates again, yeah. And also, like it's, it's maybe it's different strategies of how can we engage in these discussions in a place which is not so comfortable for discussing. They are them. really not comfortable discussing so, the discrepancy in salaries and. Interest. So so I mean I mean nobody from the institution participated in the work, you know. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so nobody participated in the work and and. Uh, and I found that sort of a bit, and because I think that it's important the work happened at that site because I think that site became so much more aware about the work um, than I would say the visitors because this went on for like, you know. So I, would, I had a studio, I, had, I was given a studio space out there and I would kind of close the curtain and I would have this private session with each, with each artist. And most of the artists were people who kind of didn't know the studio or whatever. So there was a clear awareness about you know, uh, this calculation that is going on, you know, in, so I think that tension was, and, and even during the exhibition, like I had like a small studio place within 
within the within the hall that was enclosed, and I did a few uh, portraits. I wanted to exhaust the production fund they gave me, but I couldn't exhaust it. Well, you couldn't. Uh, I, I I keep looking at the camera. You couldn't even. You wanted to actually say how much money they gave you to produce this mm -hmm. piece, and uh, how you were going to keep paying people to make portraits until that was exhausted. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a lot of money, but you they also wouldn't let you no, it was even, a lot of money. See, there you go. There's different values. <laughs> um, but, the yeah. but they they wouldn't let you actually say what your production budget was mm -hmm. in the in the um, wall text. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I, I think that but I think here's the thing, you know, I'm, I'm really interested in kind of not working as an artist who really kind of goes and defies things or completely constantly contest, but how can you s stay within these operations and situations and sustain a practice? Uh, I think for me that's like, and I think that's one of the strategies I keep looking for, where I'm also negotiating with what's possible, and in a sense, somebody, you could say that's kind of a compromise, but I feel like how can I keep that, how can I sustain such a voice, you know, and and then bring in, like for me, like there was a lot of, the humor really kind of, you know, so I was pretty aware that there's gonna be like all these amateur paintings, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, no. I, mean, I, I really, yeah. Enjoyed, you know, I really sort of enjoyed like what they did with my face out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, I think that was if you can see, I mean, this is all Vikram. These are all of the different portraits. And, so, and I think I, I find the irony in there that these actually are all kind of realistic paintings, but they're actually kind of an abstraction of something that doesn't want to be discussed. Yeah. Can we don't have much time left, so, but oh, I really wanted to show the sweeping for the for the Sharjah Art Foundation. Um, can you talk a little bit about this? Um, so. I'm not making it very make it very brief, but essentially I I was interested in in street sweepers in the UAE, and they all have a specific route, um, which they kind of circle at least three to four times during their duty hours, and they sort of at the end of that route they kind of produce you know a, a trash bag, and and so from early on I was thinking about two things. One is the the idea of how they map a specific neighborhood. And secondly, is also how, in a sense, that results in a sculptural object. But in this case, what I did was I, I got permission to work with five sweepers who worked uh, in the neighborhood of uh, the Sharjah Art Museum. And for those of you, Sharjah is one of the Emirates of the UAE. Yeah. And uh, that's where the Sharjah Art Foundation is, the Sharjah Biennial yeah. happens. Uh, and and all of this is happening right in that particular yeah. neighborhood. So this was commissioned by Sharjah Art Foundation, but I was working around the Sharjah Art Museum building. And what I did was, I worked with the sweepers and then we altered the roots of the sweepers. So they all would converge at the museum and they would, you know, plonk these trash bags out there. And so in the morning there would be three or four bags and then they would kind of repeat the route again and there would be three or four more bags added. And by 2 p.m., which is when I only work with the morning, um, uh, with the sweepers who work in the morning shift because in the afternoons I have my own job. Um, and then at two o'clock a trash, uh, a big truck would come and take these trash bags away. And this performance went on for at least three months. Um, but yes. you were dumping garbs of bag, uh, bags of garbage uh, really at the perimeter. Yeah, of the it was exactly at the, at the entrance of the museum. And even like, it was initially the entrance but then they pushed it a bit away and then we got it back. There was like all this. Who pushed it away? Uh, first, the, the museum guys, because they didn't know what was going on. But then, then they got to know what was going on. So then. So the museum that really funded it, no, the, well, no. the foundation funded it. Foundation funded it. Right. Yeah. Um, and you didn't let them know. And then how did they get it? So I think that some of them knew it and some of them didn't. You know, I, I don't think that they were so involved with what was going on. Um, and I think at one, and I think at times there were kind of you know dignitaries coming, so they would kind of move it away and bring it back. So there was some back and forth happening. But how did the sweepers understand that what they were going to do is engage in an art project? How is it that? So again, like before this project started, I spent almost uh, at least four to five months, you know, working with them. Uh, I, I 
basically kind of was, I, I kind of said I want to work with sweepers who, I was given like, a lot of sweepers in the, in, in the neighborhood, but uh, they said this is the five sweepers you can work around in the neighborhood if you want to work around their routes. And I actually kind of literally walked with all the sweepers on a regular basis in the mornings, and, uh, and that's when I sort of realized, that's when kind of even the project sort of emerged and consolidated. But also, uh, I think initially I was just interested in like their roots and like their roots, <coughs> but the relationship between the institution and the neighborhood uh, emerged as I hung out over there. Um, so I think that's an important thing I should have kind of mentioned, but the museum is in the middle of this, you know, very busy, uh, you know, <coughs> middle class neighborhood. And, and the museum and Charter Foundation has really important exhibitions, but the neighborhood isn't genuinely kind of, or isn't that much, isn't engaging with, with the institution. There's a, there's a clear kind of demarcation which sits between them, and this sort of in some way, you know, highlights that. Like, it's for the highlighted color as well. And that's the color of their trash bags. I didn't choose that color. Um, um, so I think that, that was something that, you know, I mean, I was thinking about that, but like that came through, you know, by me sort of walking with them, uh, spending time with them, understanding the dynamics between that, 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 the, understanding the dynamics within that neighborhood. Um, and then, can you talk about these a little bit? Oh, yeah. Sorry, we're, I'm, we're getting close to the end, I'm moving fast so that maybe people can so, actually ask questions. So, so essentially, this is a project called Beach, uh, which was done, which started off like, it, it, it's, it's a continuation of a relationship with the gardeners that I was working with earlier. And, and as I got to know them, I realized that most of the gardeners working in Sharjah are from Pakistan. Um, and most of them have a background in farming when they grew up in Pakistan. So they understand, you know, they understand the weather, they understand the water, they understand the soil temperature, they understand how, you know, they, they can gauge things with, with, with an amazing sensibility. And so I've been thinking about this, we've been in discussion for almost two years where what we eventually did was I got permissions to fly down to the gardeners from, from Sharjah to their respective villages in Pakistan. So one went to Sindh and one went to Punjab. And they went back to their family farms and they picked up seeds, uh, you know, which, which the family stores for the next half, for the next like seed. like heritage seeds, yeah? Uh, heirloom seeds. Or heirloom, heirloom seeds, yeah. And, and they, they got those seeds back into uh, Sharjah. And, uh, and these are unregistered seeds, so they just kind of threw them in their bags and they got them back. You know when you get the travel alert saying you're not supposed to bring any kind of yeah. vegetation or anything like that in. So it's really thinking about circulation in different mm -hmm. ways, right? Which people, I mean, you were saying before, people do anyway. Yeah. So All the time of the year. As, as I started exploring this thing, like I found out it's actually kind of going on. And it's interesting, like, uh, I mean, I'll get to that part later, but then, then the seeds have come back now. And this was actually kind of a picture in March when the biennial opened, but there was nothing out there. There was just a roundabout. Um, and now, like, what I've been negotiating with the municipality is that I, and so they can grow, so the gardeners are going to take over like this roundabout, it's in the middle of like a slight a neighborhood in Sharjah, it doesn't have so much of traffic around, and it's 40 meters in diameter, the roundabout, and basically they are going to kind of grow whatever they can grow, and they will maintain that, that part, uh, and it's, it's actually food, they're going to grow like, you know. Like a community garden. Yeah, they're yeah. going to grow stuff to kind of eat, to, to consume. And so the water that comes out there is treated sewage water, which I don't want, and which also the municipality agrees that, you know, we can't use that water because if you're going to eat food from here, like, you know, that's not the best, that the advice. So as of now, I've been fighting and trying to kind of get funds to kind of dig the road and put a sweet water pipe and fix uh, a tank out there. So I think we have come to that point where, like, we have the funds and the permissions. So hopefully in this following month, they will install the pipe and all it's still going on. And, and then it will take on. So what's the investment in doing something like this for you? I mean, it, it's, I'm looking at it and I guess we're gonna, I, I wanna just jump and end with the piece that you're putting together now for the Louvre Abu Dhabi, mm -hmm. right? But, but it's these questions of, like, for me, it's this idea of a translocality where there are, you know, people who are, workers in different positions from other places that are bringing their culture into the UAE. It, there's a constant circulation of import and export, right? Mm -hmm. and, 
and you're thinking about that with the Louvre in a whole other way mm -hmm. because it's on a different kind of level. But um, what what is it about making these sort of translocal uh, communities <clears throat> and these kinds of circulations transparent? Would you like? What do you think it actually says or does in terms of like the way that people live their lives in the UAE? I know this is a big question. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I, 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 think that, I think, I mean, there are three, four answers to this. One is, I'm going to go back to one of your earlier questions was that how do I uh, renegotiate my relationship with, with the gardeners? You know, how does that sort of continue? How does it, you know, uh, like what, what is their agency now and what stakes they have within this world? you know, is, is an important thing. And it's, and on the other hand, there is a potential which is there within the operations of a municipal, you know, um, uh, process. Right. I think that that's a very important kind of thing to activate, I feel. I, I feel like there's these moments where, like the municipalities recognize the gardeners in a whole different way or you're kind of pushing that to change a little bit so so i mean you're you got them paid more mm -hmm. i mean there are ways where like i read this thing about you being depoliticized and it's but it's on a micro level right it's not on a sort of huge it's not a huge claim so so i think yeah, i did kind of go back like so how do i kind of in a renegotiation relationship with the gardeners like what is what is your role in this and i think that it's only kind of by 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 thinking through, uh, not just thinking through separately, but while kind of making these projects is how I can sort of you know reevaluate and 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 reposition everyone's role in this. So for for example, like like the sweepers and even the gardeners earlier, like they, I I see them as now in some cases like sweepers, I see them as like uh, as performers, you know, who, who perform through that process. And so in a sense. Uh, like one invisible layer is of the work is that they all got an artist fee, but then the artist fee, but then also is like uh, I, I got the bank account numbers from the municipality which were given to charge our foundation, and the foundation was then you know made uh, you know a deposit into their account. And so I, for for me that's another kind of circulation which is important to establish, because often, and so it goes back to the question about fabrication, right? That that we all fabricate artwork that needs labor. You know, so in a sense, I'm also fabricating an artwork. If you think about this as an object, and I'm kind of getting all these people involved in the making of it. So those circuits for me are important to sort of, you know, set up. And it only happens because, A, I'm working with Charge Art Foundation. Charge Art Foundation is a big institution. It's only through them that I can kind of have a genuine access to the municipality. I can't go and do that on my own. But then, you know, how do you reconfigure the relationships between them and these gardeners and me and the municipality, uh, what are it's not just an intervention in the roundabout, but it's also an intervention in how like the engineer Charlie Art Foundation, you know, works with the engineer at the municipality. You know, how does that get uh, ever so slightly on, uh, you know, altered? Like, how does like the engineer, the municipality, kind of think about, you know, they, they could accept the fact that you know, there's still, still kind of some of them they're very slowly on kind of rethinking of how I want to engage. With, with the gardeners. I think for me that's another important shift to establish. So initially when I came in uh, and I said this is what I want to do, uh, so they said no, you cannot send these guys off. Like that's not going to happen. And then at some point like things altered and the, and the seeds came back and they knew this was going to activate. And so one guy came up and said engineer Vikram. You know for me like getting that title is something like okay fine, like you know, there is a certain um, agency that I've got within the municipal operations. Um, so I think that that's one layer about it. But then the other layer is thinking about like, you know, how, how do I, for me, like there was this very interesting conversation I was having with Christine Tome, who was the curator. But then I was also having these amazing conversations with, with the gardeners because it's important that, for me, the most important thing is also like what eventually this will mean to them. That what, what is that act? Like if the meaning they derive from me is the ultimate material of the work. And for me, that's the, you know, that's the thing. Uh, uh, for me too. You know, and, and, and so we were really concerned about like the gardeners going to Pakistan and coming back with the seeds. And and most of them convinced me that, you know, Vikram, this is a thing we often do. You know, like we bring back seeds and they actually kind of freelance for some of the local people 
and they grow like stuff out there because people want to grow things in their gardens or in their villas. So there's no concern. This is we are not kind of bringing back illegal seeds. You know, I'm not bringing back poppy seeds. Mostly, what's going to happen is that they might throw this away. But what's interesting is that the conversations I was having with them were literally kind of. I mean, their aesthetic engagement with this for me is is something that, for, for good or bad reason, only I'm privy to it. You know, hopefully it'll kind of get exposed or okay, open up to more people. But for example, Shabi said, you know, because I'm like, I'm going to bring back seeds uh, to grow stuff to, 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 to feed my stomach, you know, as simple as that. He said, like, there's nothing illegal in feeding your stomach, you know. And, and then he said this statement, you know, that become, I'll bring back, you don't, you don't worry about this, I'll bring back seeds worth my body's weight. You know, and, and somehow he was in his own way, you know, <coughs> discussing his own circulation, you know. And, and so it already had moved on from being a farming project from them to thinking about their position, you know, within uh, the migration of, of, of bodies and labor, you know, within this, within this place. Right, but I also feel like it breaks up the identity of them as as only the occupation that they're brought into the country to do, yeah. right? Uh, there's a way in which there's a different kind of recognition happening by uh, bringing them into this process that all of us have to reconfigure our positions when we when we're sort of engaged when when you bring us all into this kind of circulation of your artwork. And I think that that shift is just ever so slightly. Like, if I can it's, just say, I, yeah, I, yeah, I don't yeah, think it's I, huge. You, I, I feel like that's where, like, you know, it... But I, it's helpful to be able to, for me, it's helpful to be able to live a life like a rich social life in the UAE. Mm -hmm. Like, not to just be my particular class position or um, professional position. And, and so, I would say, if I go back, then I think they're going to start off, like, like trying to make work in the UAE, I think that uh, one thing I was clearly thinking about, like how else can I cope with living out here? You know, uh, if, if that's, a way, if that's uh, a way of thinking about having, you know, uh, I mean the word I would use is, is, is artistic practice, but if I would say that, you know, the way of coping is, is, is you know, it, you know it is a way of, of taking claim at a site or at a place or, or engaging with a place. I think that's where like, you know, my, my impetus is like, you know, of, of, of wanting to step out of the studio in that sense. I didn't have a studio, but I would say like, like me leaving my house is, is, a, is an act of like leaving the studio behind. Uh, but also then, um, I think for me, the, 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 the taking claims sort of becomes a shared thing. Yeah, for me, it's the moment where like I'm no longer a transnational subject, but I'm like a more of a translocal subject. <laughs> like I do have some sort of stake in the belonging of there that isn't actually um, sort of like narrated by the institution that I work in or the, the laws of the state, right? There's, and, and it's harder for me than it was you because I don't speak Hindi, I don't speak Urdu, I don't mm -hmm. speak some of the languages. And, and I'm a woman and, you know, all of those things. But, but these little sort of moments of rearrangement, <laughs> generative rearrangement, uh, they feel good. Uh, if it, maybe, you know, like I think about the idea of short circuits, like, you know, where there's always like, you know, like, why should I be there? Hey, I think that's, that's an important sort of move to make, you know, that me planting myself in someone else's situation or another kind of, you know. So I think we discussed about this that I'm really interested in the idea about like, you know, uh, an artistic practice being like, you know, not minding your own business. And, and so, so at some point I was thinking, well, hey, not minding your own business, can we think about that as an uh, interdisciplinary practice? Or can we think about like non -mind, not minding your own business as, you know, an interdisciplinary community? I'm still kind of trying to grapple with that thought, but like, you know, how can that work? And, and so, again, not minding your own business is also like thinking about, uh, informal economies, which sort of is, as of now, is, 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 is a very available material in the UAE, which actually kind of gets shaped around because of this place becoming this node where you have to 
you know, you, you're gonna have these encounters, but then you make something out of these encounters, and that's why it even goes back to the idea of form processes, uh, which is how I term my practice, right. because in a, in a sense, it's kind of looking at like, it's stemming from the found object, sort of, you know, I'm trying to also on the other hand, trying to kind of, you know, position my, my practice within kind of a Western heart history kind of discourse by putting this label, but I'm really interested in the idea of the encounter which Duchamp spoke about. You know, that's, that's an important thing, as against the object, but the encounter. So how do you kind of, you know, uh, w what does an encounter mean in the UAE? Uh, well, that, that kind of takes us to the Loop Project, but I'm gonna stop for a second and open it up to questions, and then maybe, like, to end, you can just quickly see what you're doing with the Loop that just okay. happened to. But do people have questions? We talk a lot. Sorry. Sorry? So I can't hear you. Do you want to go back? Um, yeah, I guess I haven't left that place in that sense. So, but your piece is canceled. Hmm? Yeah, it, so. It, it's a weird situation. Yeah. So I, I, I actually don't have a clear, of course I will go back because I'm pursuing projects out there. So, yeah, I mean, but I don't think that, you know, even if I go back, uh, I'm actually not going back to that place. You know, I have kind of, in some way, maybe restart out there. Yeah. But yeah, I can only go back to India if I have to kind of go back. You know, but, but I mean, of course, at that place, kind of, I have a lot of stakes out there, so I will go back in some way. Well, it's also, there's so much more, I mean, there's so much more you can do. That's something else I've been thinking about. Like how do I kind of take those questions elsewhere? Uh, you know, so like me coming out here, uh, and to be honest, like I'm kind of uh, struggling right now to sort of settle in into this kind of this, this place. But uh, that's a, that's a very clear sort of uh, thing on my mind. You know, like how else? How do these sort of uh, strategies operate elsewhere? So I, I only kind of have to find out with time and and see if they work or not. The thing that we had been talking about is that, it, for me, the, the practice that you put together is so uniquely suited for the UAE and that maybe the practices aren't analogous. Mm -hmm. That some of them, you know, you can take some of it or not. But, but what you said about the UAE being open mm -hmm. is not necessarily the same way, I mean, New York is. Yeah. yeah. Like also, like if I were going to develop practice in Bombay, it wouldn't be this. I mean, I don't even know what it would be, but I know it wouldn't be this. So I think that's this, this situation that kind of risen from me being over there. So, so I wouldn't want to kind of really enforce them elsewhere. Because I don't think they're more like, it's not like, you know, how can I put it? It's, it's not like an artistic style that I have, which I can kind of take somewhere else. No, it's not a signature, but I would mm. certainly say it's a, Kind of, kind of, you know, where can it go next is sort of, I feel it should be guided by whatever is emerging between us and I, as against like also having these, there's also the other idea of having expectations of massive change or agency. Um, whereas I'm more interested in kind of working within constraints and and they're not like, like there are no emancipatory moments where complete. I, yeah, so I think that that's something I kind of, you know, 
like trying to create. So I'm going to... So this is this question. Right, yes. Can you talk more about the, how you come across those constraints and whether you find them or you find yourself within a certain set of rules that you have to deal with or whether you're trying to... Because I also found that with the painting project, for instance, it was more you also bringing the constraints inside of the project, whether it's other projects are more Yeah, so I would say that most of the constraints, in a sense, uh, are borrowed. You know, like they, they sort of, they, they, I mean, they're active somewhere else in some other, for some other uh, purpose or for some other uh, transaction. Um, but it depends on like where I'm hanging out, as simple as that, you know. Some of my earlier works were kind of far more independent. You know, like the bricks piece was was a commission for for an art fair, for a local art fair, which wasn't so invested in, in exactly what I was doing, and and so I had to kind of orchestrate everything on my own. Um, so in a sense, you know, like the constraints do not come with even the situation of exhibiting a work. Whereas, like if I'm going to exhibit a work at Tashkir, you know, I'm already kind of engaging with an institution within which I have to kind of place this work. And, and then there are these dual sort of places I'm engaging with. One is the institution and one is the world I want to engage with. Again, like the access to the gardeners only happened because I got a commission from an art center which actually is part of the municipality. So I saw a potential out there that I can, so to, to come back, to, this is a short story. Like, I think that's how like, the things work for me. Like, Mariah Center who commissioned me um, the Gardner's project. I did an exhibition with them a year earlier as well for something else. And essentially I had to go and collect my my artist fee from them. And so Sharjah is almost like an hour away and or 45 minutes away. And I mean I wouldn't otherwise go out there, you know. I don't know if this answers your question, but I need to kind of put this out over there. So I was going to Sharjah to collect my artist fee. But on the other hand, I also had to pay uh, a fine because I jumped a red signal in Sharjah. So I have to go to the Sharjah traffic office and I have to make myself present and pay themselves in cash. And so I'm like, hey, I, went, I said like, maybe just, let me just kind of make this one drive. I'll go there, do both these things and come back. So then I go to the Sharjah Shuruk office and collect my artist fee. And this is a government body. And I realized that, hold on, I'm going to drive over to another government body and actually take this artist fee and give it to those guys as my traffic fine. It was a very handsome traffic fine. It was a jump red signal. And so what I realized was that, hey, could you guys make this transfer internally? Well, this is my thought, like, you know. And, and that was a seed for the thought that, hey, next time if I work with Mariah, I can access the municipality. Because Here's one more thing, that I didn't know the Mariah Art Center, who actually, at that point, come, uh, when I did the exhibition, not the gardeners, the one before, I didn't know they actually kind of were, were a government body. Um, and so then when I went to pay the, pay the money, so we computer go to Shuruk, which is like where Mar what Mariah works for, which is the government body. So, for all, so basically I realized at that point, that for a future exhibition, I can access um, the government if they commission me for whatever work it is. But then, when I even realized that, I also realized that there is a certain capacity within which I can work. And so for me, that constraint it also becomes a potential. Uh, you know, it's, it's a broad way of answering your question. Um, and so, I forget your question, but, but, but for me, like, the, the, uh, for me, constraints are important because on the other hand, I'm also interested in how we just operate every day. You know, we, we work, we, we sort of, at least I've been raised, you know, in a way to kind of, you know, when you think about like, you know, being selfish, succeeding in life, whatever, all of these basic factors, I feel like these all kind of are an awareness of like, you know, constraints within which we operate. And so I'm interested in like those constraints to be the material in whatever capacity it is. And also, whether the two of you guys would agree with this observation that 
maybe that that space or the culture there is a culture of constraints, but it's uh, one where you're required to understand your constraints in, intuitively or through lived experience. Yeah, it's never declared to you after the fact, and often the <coughs> the confrontations that happen happen between people who expect no constraints, like complete uh, ability to do anything and everything, like total freedom of expression, and these kind of undeclared constraints, because a lot of the constraints are not declared. It's like the way they the way they appear is when you cross a line, and then you're told that okay, you shouldn't have crossed that line. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of the space where like you're constantly. Uh, Pushing a little bit and then seeing if you get away with it. I mean, I think it's also part of the informality of the of the of the economy or the, the social space as well. But uh, when I came, I didn't understand any of that. So I was operating on a whole different level, and it it took me a long time to understand. First of all, to push the limits, and then and then to sort of and to, and then I because I'd lived here for so long, I anticipated the sort of um, the force, the pushback, which then you didn't get, but you did not didn't get either, right? Yeah. So it's it's that crazy moment where you have to either like it's you have to be able to go with it, and that and and the thing that Vikram said, and you you know you grew up there, so it's different for you, but but that takes time to figure out. I mean, it took time for everybody kept saying. How do we meet Emiratis? How do we get into the art scene when we all sort of showed up as NYU Abu Dhabi in the beginning? And it was like this great, um, it, was, it was this great challenge to meet the people who are outside of the university and, and, and everybody was trying and couldn't figure it out. And then all of a sudden it just started coming. Like, uh, you know, Maya said this, Bikram picked me. Like, I was just like, I don't know how it happened, but. I'm just going to go with it, and as Barbara knows, I'm not such a go with the flow person. So, so the the environment teaches you that too, yeah. But it takes a lot. It takes, it's a, like in that's what I kind of am amazed about in Vikram's practice is that he knows that it takes time, and you keep cultivating it. Yeah, and I think some of it also just has to do with like, uh, like trying. Like, because a lot of people think about things, and then a lot of people second guess themselves out of them. By saying that, well, it wouldn't be possible for this reason, this reason, this reason. And at least in, in the two or three times we have become a work together, I get the sense, and I'm never part of the entire process, but I definitely feel like it's been a, it's a long process, and it's a it's a very methodical, stepwise process. Like it's like I did this, and I identified these three possibilities. I agree. And then I tested all three of those possibilities, and then okay, well, this one is impossible, but these two have opened up into these. Uh, situations, and then you keep going stepwise. You don't try to orchestrate mm -hmm. the whole thing beforehand. And I, I wonder again whether maybe that's something that's part and parcel of this informal way of, of, of conducting. Like, I wonder that too. And it's also yeah. changing, like quite dramatically in the UAE. Things are becoming very, very formalized <coughs> and very, very. Difficult. Yes, really uh, quickly. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, but traditionally, it's not been that way. I mean, I, I just wanted to add that um, you know. I'm sorry. I'm um, just saying, if you have to have a program where she'll just be the last point, if that's okay. okay. You can sure. Your questions, then we'll <laughs> yeah. Them. No, I was just going to say that, you know, people are working the constraints all the time. I mean, as you said, these guys are are bringing seeds over mm -hmm. the border all the time, right? And mm -hmm. so in some ways, you're, you're, um, you're sort of inserting yourself into, into this kind of informal economy that already exists, mm -hmm. right? So it's not that... I don't know. The, he's not activating it. It's already it's active. It's there. Yeah. And so you're working with that. You know. But I'm just kind of, I am kind of diverting it through like an institution which sort of in some way highlights it. Mm -hmm. And some way even corrupts the institution. Mm -hmm. I'm just missing the idea of corruption, but not like corruption, mm -hmm. but like mm -hmm. that's something I'm interested in. Sorry, you had a question. Uh, no, yeah, I was going to ask. Um, so about the piece that you did for the Venice Biennale, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of like The great pieces. Mm -hmm. So essentially, like, I, I give a time constraint uh, to the exhibition designers, mm -hmm. and then uh, the Italian masons have to work within that time constraint. Okay. So I didn't even go there to install it, right? and I was pretty perfectly happy with what happened with that. Okay, I, guess I, I meant more in like how uh, it was written about, how it was talked about in relation to other works that were at the festivals. A lot of people probably aren't that familiar with like, Dubai or. 
So actually, there's not much to be honest written about it, like by the press. Or I, think I haven't come across uh, much about that. Right? Like there wasn't much kind of. Uh, well, there, there was one line that said that uh, it was basically uh, a kind of a, to paraphrase, like a government institutionally uh, back show that was allowing people to be critical outside of the the nation. Uh, the edgy state. Thing? Yeah. So this idea that like play was fine mm -hmm. as long as you do it elsewhere, but you don't fuck it up. Which I think I would still advise you to have anything to do with play, but mm -hmm. still. You know, that, uh, that, that sense of play, the criticality that was embedded in the sense of play, uh, actually uh, didn't feel very strong because the whole thing was uh, being presented by, by the government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the only kind of, uh, there wasn't like, you know, a definite, like, for me it's more about like, the engagements I had in conversation with people, but there was no sort of, uh, like, I don't remember like having like a, a response to the work you know, in a public discussion. But I do want to come back to software oh, yeah. what you're talking about. Can I just oh, sorry, yeah. Ralph, can we get one more minute? Thank you. But then we can just, <laughs> just hang out over here, right? Or no? We can hang out downstairs. Okay. I think I that, that yeah. yeah. I think there's, it's a labor issue. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> That's exactly what I want. Um, no, but go ahead, say the one thing. So this is, this is, uh, I was asking, I was like, also I realized with time that somehow like you're already assimilated in that community even before you enter it. So for example, like I never learned Arabic out there. You never had the need to learn the language out there. In fact, there are a lot of locals who speak Hindi. You know, and so I find that porousness very interesting. That and to come back to what we were saying, like you know, when you try to push the borders, but already like there might not be a hurdle out there. You know, so I find those that looseness interesting. Yeah, there's sometimes the ex I have more of an expectation that there will be. Mm -hmm. Are you disappointed? <laughs> no, I I have to change. <laughs> I mean, I change in the process, right? Yeah. No, I I'm learning. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it.